Well, it's actually quite simple. Uh, here you can see a brief explanation of what permaculture is, and I'll go a little bit more in depth. The first and perhaps most important element of permaculture is design. Permaculture design is key to developing sustainable agriculture. We combine several systems practiced in natural farming, organic farming, and green building. Food production systems like perennial polyculture, sustainable irrigation systems like catchments and swales, organic fertilizing systems like compost, and vertical layouts with plant layering allow permaculture farms to effectively provide food in a manner that restores the environment and gives equivalent or even increased yields over conventional farming. Uh, the system is so powerful, not only can we grow our food without using any pesticides, inorganic fertilizers, or unsustainable inter or irrigation, and not only can we use this type of farming to give higher kilocalorie-based food yields than conventional farming, we can even use these methods to reclaim marginal land or land that is not even considered arable due to desertification. So basically, permaculture design uses zones, uh, distinguished by the number zero to five. First we have zone zero, which is the home area. Uh, <coughs> And basically, you want to be using something like solar, solar, and, and uh, solar heating and green design to maximize efficiency and, and uh, you know be environmentally friendly. Zone one would be the kitchen garden, uh, which would be uh, the plants that require a lot of attention, and this would potentially include like herbs, uh, some salad crops, soft fruits like strawberries, as well as possibly worm composting for chicken waste. Zone two is going to include perennials, uh, which require only moderate attention and occasional pruning. Uh, and this would be like the smaller fruit and nut trees, possibly beehives and compost sites. Zone three is the main cropping zone, where you would have large fruit and nut trees as well as intercropping systems with rotation, and where on farms with animals you would have pastures. Zone four is a foraging and wood harvesting area, which can be used to collect wild food. And finally, zone five, which is, I don't believe on this, yeah, it's not on this picture. Zone five is a completely wild zone. Com oh, really? <laughs> uh, keeping with the underlying philosophy of natural ecological development. Now, firstly, before planting anything, the site is carefully prepped, and this includes, importantly, green mulching and other forms of natural soil conditioning. Uh, swales like these are dug for natural irrigation, especially in areas of water scarcity. Uh, water storage tanks are built at the highest elevations on the property, so they can provide water and irrigation with minimal energy use. We use gravity. It's really cool. Uh, so permaculture strives to work with nature, so we use polyculture planting systems, which integrate perennials, annuals, and semi-annuals into a seven-layer forest garden. And I'm not going to talk too much about it. You can read it. It's on the board. Uh, basically, this type of design can make, make much better use of space, and that's where the higher yields can come from. In addition, these plants are all going to be working with each other, providing multifunctional support. For example, lavender to keep pests away, bamboo perennials serving as windscreens. So with well-planned intercropping and polyculture, that, uh, natural forms of integrated pest management, effective use of sloping and terracing composting, and also innovations like natural chicken, chicken tractor tilling, uh, we can use permaculture to serve as an effective form of farming natural organic food. Uh, and I'm going to repeat it again because it's important. This form of far farming can actually increase food yields over conventional farming. Polyculture methods, according to veteran permaculture farmer David Bloom, can produce 3 to 10 pounds of food per, uh, or produce per, per square foot, which uh, compared to commercial agriculture in California produces only 1.5 to 2.5 pounds per square foot. Uh, he argues that even in a sloppy permaculture system, 500 square feet should be sufficient to feed one person, and 200 square feet should be enough in a, man in a well managed site. He also points out the uh, essential mycorrhizal sym symbiosis in polyculture and how this is destroyed in chemical agriculture. Even non polyculture organic farms still achieve yields close to, if not matching, conventional farms. According to various studies, anywhere from 80 to 90 percent as much food can be obtained from a non intercropped organic farm. In permaculture, while the yield of an individual crop is lower than if it were grown alone in an equivalent area, because of the polyculture practices, the combined yield is higher than that of a single plant in a monoculture system. So uh, here we have this really excellent agricultural solution, and it, uh, it meets the first two definitions of sustainability clearly. But the question is, can this also provide a commercially based income for farmers and enhance the quality of life for society? Uh, it's undeniable that in today's climate, if the farm does not successfully provide a monetary income for the producers, it will not be viable. Uh, and this is not so simple. A person selling a, a greater quantity of a single crop can afford a lower price per unit or per weight than someone with a smaller total quantity of the same crop. Uh, some <laughs> solutions exist to this also. Brendan pointed out yesterday, the organic industry has been growing by 20% per year, so there's, uh, there's demand. And also using community-supported agriculture is another good way to make the farm viable. But can this be applied to commercially offset the damage being done by our industry? 
And this is the biggest problem, and this leads me back to Darwin uh, adaptation and Taiwan. Now this is a Taiwan market, uh, which unlike most of America, Taiwan still relies heavily on these markets. And although we have plenty of supermarkets, they don't offer the massive quantities and varieties of an American grocery store. Now personally, I consider this to be a good thing. The homogenization of farming is not nearly so pervasive here. And so while we, have, we still have some subsistence farming, and a great deal of locally produced food can still go directly to market. But compared to the massive agribusiness of the United States, this is a drop in the bucket. Commercial farms are big business, and with that comes large pressures upon government and industry. Uh, the economic imperative to maximize profits can often compel decisions that reflect the goal of dollars over sustainability. And this provides a problem for progressive farming that may not garner short-term profit increases for commercial companies. So you might ask why, if permaculture can in fact provide larger quantities of food, would it be less economically viable in the long term? Well, the answers illustrate the true tragedy of the situation and the desperate need for change not only on the farms, but in our thinking and business practices. To this day, the effects of atrazine are disputed thanks to studies that failed to reproduce the results that showed male tadpoles became hermaphroditic. Uh, but these studies, which refute, refute the negative effects of atrazine, were carried out by Syngenta, the company that produced the chemical. Well, that's a clear conflict of interest. Nevertheless, in 2006, the EPA concluded that triazine pesticides, which contain atrazine, would pose no harm that would result to the general U.S. population, infants, children, or other consumers. Now, considering that this, uh, this statement was done after 50 private meetings with Syngenta, uh, and despite the EU ban, it seems clear that corporate influence over government policy in America is proving to be a barrier to progress towards environmental su sustainability, rather than encouraging it. In addition, farm subsidies, I know, one more minute. In addition, farm subsidies, uh, in America at least, are based on the type of crops rather than the farm area. And so monoculture, while not ecologically sustainable, becomes financially sustainable for farmers who are looking to make larger profits and receive money from the government. What's worse, the large-scale farms, which are the biggest polluters and are notorious for pushing out locally-oriented farming, uh, they receive the largest share of the subsidy monies. According to the U.S. General Accounting Office, from 1990 to 2001, subsidies to large farms triple, while payments to small farms remain constant. And I wonder personally, without these subsidies, would the cost of these products, especially those which are shipped overseas, still be able to undercut local production? Uh, but let's return to the core issue, which is the environment. The idea that we can locally produce higher amounts of food and be environmentally sustainable is profound. But to achieve this, we need to shift our conceptions and our thinking to embrace the idea of sustainability over profit. Local blade. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, local based small scale producers cannot compete with multinationals, especially when subsidies are involved. And more to the point, the goal of feeding people is not simply a matter of economics. After all, in the United States, we are guaranteed the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But without healthy food to eat, how is life possible? Feeding people must be undertaken, undertaken, independent of pure profit motives, simply because food consumption is not a matter of desire, but of need. We have the right to food. Certainly one could theoretically develop an extremely large permaculture farm and with innovative marketing enjoy a healthy profit. But once again, this would move away from localized production and therefore require larger resource inputs for shipping. Nevertheless, that still would be a massive step forward and we still need that. Uh, but make no mistake, we have to adapt our thinking to whole ecosystem approaches, and we need to do this simply to survive. Sustainability is not a mentality or a lifestyle choice, or even a matter of economic or political policy. We've already debated and discussed this issue for decades, and the problems still worsen. Change to agricultural practices is a stark and immediate necessity. Our conventional farming systems wreak havoc upon, havoc upon the natural world, and we are already at critical levels of environmental destruction. Darwin's message remains. Adapt or perish.